Welcome, comadres, and welcome to another episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy, and we have an awesome guest today. Her name is La Cuesta, and I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, Marcy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I am La Cuesta Arena. I am a licensed therapist, entrepreneur, and an autism mom. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the way I got connected with La Cuesta, I always do like a little intro of how I know my guests. Um, I, she went viral. Her son went viral with her, his barber. And um, I started following her. I saw that she was a fellow autism mom. And basically, you know, she's, she aligns a lot with the purpose of the podcast which is, um, you know, bringing awareness, not only that, but also helping moms take care of themselves, um, you know, looking into wellness and all of that, and which is very hard for moms of kids with special needs to do because um, we're always, you know, giving 120% of ourselves or even more. So um, I wanted to bring her on the show to pick her brain and, and you know, see where she's at. Um, so today's topic is um, an autism parent's journey. So the reason why the topic came about is that we often forget to highlight these amazing parents that are doing the work and helping other people. And, um, you know, I feel very strongly about giving flowers to the heroes that we have every day now. Um, so... Let's just get a couple of uh, logistics out of the way. Uh, what is your child's diagnosis? So my son, Jackson, I may refer to him as Jack Jack at times, but he was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder just before his third birthday. Okay. So what was it that you noticed? When, when was it that you noticed that your son was quote unquote different? Yeah, it was it was kind of difficult for me because I have an older son. So my oldest son, he is like 10, 11 years older than Jackson. So I was kind of out of the game when it comes to like having a little baby. So when Jackson came along, you know, it was like typical baby. I'm like, I'm a lot older, you know, at this point, I'm what they consider advanced maternal age, which is what, 35, 36 at the time. And, you know, so I'm which like, not that I know, sure. but you know, <laughs> my doctor was like, okay, you're high risk. Um, you're advanced maternal age, which kind of hurt my feelings. So I already went into this pregnancy, you know, high risk. Um, I had like preeclampsia, which I got after he was born and mm -hmm. you know I just thought okay this pregnancy is different I'm a lot older you know and then with him being a baby typical baby you know he didn't really have like any illnesses or anything that I kind of picked up on you know with babies you know all babies are different and then of course like I said I'm kind of out of the game at this point I'm trying to relearn these things but as mm -hmm. he started you know getting those milestone ages I started noticing things like he wasn't he wasn't talking so at one you know most kids they're you know at least saying mama or dad or trying to form words Jackson wasn't doing mm -hmm. any of that um, he would very, he would kind of fixate on certain things. So going from one to two, you know, he kind of, he started walking regular age, crawling, all of those things. Like that was fine. But it, for me, it was really like the speech and his communication. He wasn't talking mm -hmm. at two. He still didn't have any words. He had maybe one word, which was hot. And I started freaking out. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And it wasn't actually until I went on a business lunch with a friend. So I'm a licensed therapist. And, you know, I had started my private practice. I'm tired of being kind of like a stay-at-home mom after leaving the military. Mm -hmm. And I met this other um, 
this other mom, she was a nurse practitioner and we were having this business lunch to kind of talk about how we could work together um, helping veterans. And somehow at this lunch, she started talking about her sons who are, you know, at the time, like 18 and one was like in his 20s. And she was saying how her son was diagnosed with autism and she had missed so many signs along the way and she was blaming herself being a nurse practitioner and this lady starts breaking down crying you know we had only oh talked gosh. a couple times like on the phone so i didn't know her that well but she like broke down crying at this lunch and you know i'm trying to console her but at the same time i'm like freaking out like oh my gosh like some of the things she's saying like you know am i missing signs like am i I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, that is that. <laughs> That's okay. You just said a note on the door. <laughs> it's okay. You could. You, do you want to check the note? It's okay. Yes, right. Hold on. We can pick back up where you where you left off. Look what he. Oh my gosh, he just. <laughs> I told her, I said, Jacqueline, I need you to stay downstairs and be quiet like while we have the interview. And of course, he comes running up here. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We can, we can, we can um, pick up where we left off. So one, two, three, action. So the lady, um, your friend started crying at the, at the business dinner. Not the business dinner, the business lunch. lunch, and and you started know you started thinking like, oh, um, Jackson has some of these signs that she was saying. Yeah. So when she started crying, I'm trying to console her, but inside I'm kind of like freaking out, like, what if I'm missing sometimes some signs? You know, at this point, Jackson was he was like two, a little older than two years old. And some of the stuff she said, you know, he wasn't at that point yet. So she was saying like something with tying the shoes and just, you know, like the mm-hmm. speech delay and just certain things like her son would um, be fixated on certain objects. And, you mm-hmm. know, that really kind of got me because Jackson, you know, he loved puzzles and he would, you know, stare off into space and just really be hyper focused on anything, couldn't get his attention mm-hmm. and started having like these horrible tantrums. And so once, you know, she kind of calmed down, I immediately, I mean, I don't think I left the parking lot before I called Jackson's pediatrician and tried to make an appointment. So we get this appointment and I bring him in within like a couple of days and she's doing an examination. She's asking me all these questions. If you're an autism parent, you know, the million questions oh, they yeah. ask you. And I'm like feeling bad because I don't know, like all these milestones, like at what age did he flip over? I mean, what age mm-hmm. did he crawl? Like all of these things. Um, but as she's examining him, like she had like a character on her stethoscope and she noticed he was like kind of fixated on that character like he wasn't paying attention she was trying to get his attention and so at that mm-hmm. point she said i'm gonna put the referral in we had tricare at the time so you know military you have to jump through like a gazillion hoops um mm-hmm. but she said it's gonna be a wait list <laughs> six months of wait list and i'm like freaking out like what am i supposed to do oh in six God. months Um, But she told me about early intervention services. Um, We were kind of new to New Jersey. Um, We had left from North Carolina, came to New Jersey. And she was like, well, call this number. This is early intervention. He probably qualifies for that. You can do that in the meantime. And so that's what we did. Um, Call early intervention and got in with them while we waited the six months to get him in to CHOP. Um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, to okay. get him diagnosed, well, evaluated. Wow, that is that like resonates a lot with um, the my story. Uh, I don't know, but like when Aiden, he was talking, and then he stopped talking. So that was like the biggest red flag for me. And then when I go to the pediatrician, my pediatrician wasn't as good as yours. She was like. Oh, maybe you should wait. 
and I'm, you know, I've been working with kids my whole life and, um, you know, I have a bunch of little cousins and yeah. stuff. And I'm like, once kids start talking, they don't stop. Like, that's not normal. So I had to like really push for that. But um, I'm glad that he was able to get the early intervention. Um, how was it? Like, what what services did they give him at the beginning? I know speech, mm-hmm. anything else that yeah. they included? So he got speech, um, he got OT, and he couldn't officially get ABA um, therapy at that point, but they were just amazing. Um, the therapist would come out to our house pretty much three, four times a week. Um, I hadn't really set up my practice yet, so I was... I had a flexible schedule, so she would come work with him with speech, also work on behaviors, and then work with the family. So, you know, at the time I was married and we had like two teenagers in the home. And so really trying to get everybody kind of, you know, on the same page when it comes to like when he has tantrums, when he's refusing to eat, um, some of these things like strategies we can do. Mm -hmm. And he... You know, we continue with early intervention. He was going to age out at age three, but because he was getting early intervention, they said he qualified for pre-K. And so we just started Mm -hmm. prepping for pre-K. And through um, being persistent, um, no one, you know, I never thought I would be like a like an advocate or anything like that. But when you have a child who has special needs, like you really have to kind of um, pick up that torch. And, you know, we would call like every day. Hey, did you, do you have a cancellation? Can we get in earlier? What can we do? Like mm-hmm. we're a military family. I'm like throwing every sympathy card. And finally, um, they had an opening where they could see us earlier than the six months. And we took it, we took him down to get evaluated, which, oh my gosh, that was its own process. But Mm -hmm. um, we got his diagnosis just before he turned three years old and he was getting ready to go into pre-K at the same time. So it was pretty good timing. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm I'm glad. Um, I feel like the process is a little different in New York. Um, He was... He got diagnosed, and, and the initial diagnosis was PDDNOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And then eventually he had got the autism diagnosis, but I had to push for that because in the school, they don't really do the evaluations. I had to um, get a neuropsychological evaluation, and, and the neuropsychologist was the one that um, gave him the autism diagnosis. So what was it like with your family, like, not necessarily the nuclear family, like your your sons and and your ex husband, but like with the rest of your family. Like, did you feel like you were supported um, through the process, or you know? Yeah. So it's interesting that you say that. I think my family was being as supportive as they knew how to be, and that is reassuring me that nothing's wrong with my child. <laughs> Um, And I say that because there's nothing wrong with him, but, you know, culturally, you know, a lot of Black Mm -hmm. families, African-American families, like we, you know, we don't necessarily trust like medical doctors, medical professionals, and, you know, they're (laughs) very quick to, (laughs) very quick to give a diagnosis. And so they're kind of leery, especially like my mom, um, you know, she would always be there to support me and tell me, you know, don't worry about it. He's going to start talking. Once he starts talking, he's never going to stop. Like, there's nothing wrong with my baby. And I appreciate her being, like, supportive. But, you know, coming to grips with, like, the diagnosis, like, that was, like, a whole thing, like, for me to kind of wrap my my head around. So, you know, being comfortable enough to kind of tell my family, okay, this is what the doctor says, um, his diagnosis is, and this is what we're doing moving forward. So that, it was kind of tricky, but overall, everybody was supportive. I love that. Um, So I'm going to get a little serious with you. So what are some of your fears or reservations as a parent of a child, of a young 
boy who will eventually be a young man with autism. <laughs> I know there's a lot of complications because, yes. like, you know, we're people of color, mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then having a, a, a special need is another, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm a single mom, two black, raising two black boys, and I always say, like, when they're young, they're so cute and everybody loves them. When they grow up, everybody fears them. And so, like, with my oldest son, um, he, he'll he be 17 and he's, like, 6'3". Uh, most people think he's, like... Mm -hmm. He's like my boyfriend or my husband or something because he is so big, but he's so quiet and so meek, wouldn't, you know, hurt a fly. Now with Jackson, and I've heard stories of, you know, um, people with autism being, you know, attacked yes. by the police and, you know, he makes certain moves and, you know, I'm always like, you know, especially when we're out in public, like, okay, society says you must act this way, even though we know, I mean, <laughs> your children, like you can't be expected uh -huh. to necessarily be still for eight hours a day and listen to, you know, exactly what a parent or an adult may tell you. So, yeah, my fear is that, you know, someone's going to look at my son, think that he's a threat um, and take action against him, which could cost him his life. Um, we had this incident. So Jackson entered kindergarten this year. And let me tell you, from the the first day of school, I got a phone call from the school. You need to come to the school. I'm like, what? This is like, I mean, we're like three hours into the school day. I called. They said, well, he's, he's showing out. You need to come get him. I'm like, what? Like, this is the first day. So I go in already on the defensive um, mm -hmm. I'm like, what is going on here? And they're like, okay, you need to come get him. We don't know him. We don't know what he's he's like. So we just need you to come get him. Well, did you read his IEP? You do know, you knew beforehand, like what his um, challenges were, which one is transitioning. Like he's going from pre-K to big school. Mm -hmm. This whole new people, like it's a lot for him to take in and your first response is to call me to come get him. Well, we ended up kind of, you know, to a point where they were like, okay, he's calmed down now. You know, he can stay if you feel comfortable, which, you know, I talked to him. He wanted to stay at school and come to find out the reason he quote unquote um, had this tantrum is they were, kind of showing the kids like, okay, this is the media center. This is the cafeteria. When they went to the cafeteria, they was like, okay, this is the cafeteria. This is where you're going to eat lunch. He thought, okay, it's time to eat lunch. And so he uh, didn't yeah. realize, okay, we're just showing you we're going to come back later. So he refused to leave. And then a teacher tried to touch him or grab him and he ran off. Any child, I can't. especially a child on the spectrum, would probably have a similar response. And all of these teachers who, you know, are aggressively coming at him, he's not going to calm down. And so once we got that figured out, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I get it. It's the first day of school. But then the third day of school, the fifth day of school, it just kept going on and on. Like the teacher was literally <laughs> sending me messages during the day. And I'm like, listen, lady, like I have clients. I know I work from home, but that doesn't mean that I can sit here and go back and forth with you all day. What is the issue? What is the problem? I felt like they just didn't want to be bothered with him. So eventually... I get a phone call from the teacher. She said, Jackson bit her and he knocked over some stuff. And I'm like, oh, man, right. Like what, well, what happened? No one could tell me exactly what happened. You know, they just suggested that we have a meeting. They want to evaluate him. Um, that's all she told me. Jackson comes home on the bus that day. 
a note in his book bag saying not to return to school for like two or three days because he was suspended. Like kindergarten suspended. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna let you finish your story there and I'm gonna get into that. <laughs> I was like, I was just so I like text the bus driver. I was like, hey, don't come get Jackson in the morning. He's suspended. The bus driver was like, what? Jackson? He's like, Jackson is the smartest kid I have on the bus. I don't understand. I was like, I don't understand. You can come get him Monday. Apparently he's suspended. I was not a happy camper. <laughs> um, the following, like when we had the meeting, I'm thinking, okay, you're about to tell me what happened, this evaluation. I'm sitting in this meeting, Zoom, my ex-husband is there, I'm there, and it's like five administrators and teachers, and I'm like, what is going on? And they're talking, oh, Jackson is wonderful, he's so smart, this, and, but we, we think he needs to be moved to this program for kids that have disciplinary problems. I was like, wait, what? Like, what? first of all, what kind of meeting is this? Like, I'm confused. <laughs> so it turned into a whole thing where they moved him to a different school. Like, it, it was just a, uh-uh. it was horrible. Like, worst experience. But, you know, I'm like, I don't want my son to be with anyone who, one, doesn't have patience. And two, who doesn't want to be bothered because he can feel your energy. And if you don't want to be bothered with him, you're not yes. going to have a good time with him. Like he mm-hmm. feels it. like when I'm upset, he's upset. So if you're coming at him with all this nervous energy and you don't want to be bothered, um, he's going to give it to you. That's just mm-hmm. how it is. Let me tell you, um, Aiden, um, I get upset at him if he does something bad. And then I'm like, I'm um I'm, I'm I'm upset with you. He's like and I'm upset with mommy. Um no but seriously it's it's like it's it's incredible. Um I mean when he got evaluated when they made the IEP, did they say that he needs to be in a smaller setting or or he is I, I feel like he's okay to be in in a regular class. Like based on what I've seen and how like you know the videos and everything and, and how, how he behaves. Mm-hmm. What was the, in the IEP, what was the setting that they recommended yeah, for him? That he would be in a mixed classroom. Um, so. An ICT, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, like, at, like, if he's in an ICT class, there should have been a special education teacher in there in the first place, right? And the special education teacher should have read the IEP, number one. She should have, or he, I don't know if it was a man, but the person should have been aware of strategies to use and it's just it's just really like it's bananas to me the fact that they made you go through all of that how many months did that last how many months did what last the 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 with the whole problem with the school until they switched them to the new school so school started i would say by two months before they moved him like it was Mm -hmm. ridiculous and my my first option was okay I don't even want to deal with like the school system I want to pull him out oh you don't have that option anymore virtual unless you just completely withdraw him and you're basically on your own which I wow. couldn't do at the time um it, it <laughs> when I tell you like I, I wrote a Facebook post um because I had to deal I had to process everything like I was just going through mm-hmm. all the emotions and so many people reached out to me like hey like I'm an advocate I can help you like this is what I do blah 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 like people who I'm friends with or they knew somebody I knew like lots of principals just not in this school system so we we're in a different school system mm-hmm. and looking back it's probably the best thing that happened to him. Like I, I hate it happened the way it did, but where he's at is so much better now. They still didn't do mm-hmm. what they were supposed to do properly. They violated his rights. And, mm-hmm. you know, I absolutely could push the issue, but I think he's he needs to be surrounded by adults who love him, who have patience, who actually enjoy their job and, you know, are going to make sure that he's getting what he's, what he needs. And he has that now. Like I was very confrontational with 
like the new assistant principal, like she was, she was in the, um, in the meeting where they told me this, like, she Mm -hmm. called me when he started at the new school, she called me and I immediately had an attitude and (laughs) she was like, I just wanted to let you know, like, we absolutely love Jackson. Like he's doing great. I was like, oh, okay. Like I get like PTSD every time I get a phone call from the school, but he's doing so well. Like, you know, he, because he has teachers who one are competent and two, um, actually have the patience to know that, okay, he may go through some challenges, but Jackson is really smart. He's actually doing work above his grade level, um, which I think he was just bored. Like Jackson yeah. knew a lot of the stuff they were teaching, like in pre, cause he was in pre-K since three. So mm-hmm. by the time he got to kindergarten, he, he knows He's all like, this whatever. stuff. whatever. I know yeah. all this stuff. So I think yeah. that was a big part of it. And yeah, he's, he's doing pretty good now. He has like his days. I think he's to the point now where he says school is boring um he he's very artistic so I think he enjoys that a lot more yeah I love I love his drawings and how um he's very expressive and and he's just like he's just I I would love to have a kid a student like that in my class like honestly because like to your point like it's very noticeable when people love their profession. You know what I'm saying? Like when you meet a teacher that really enjoys what they do and that they're really dedicated to their craft and not passing judgment on the child and trying to figure them out, it makes our time as parents uh, very different. You know, Um, I honestly, like I want to say, I kind of went through that when my son started um, junior high school like two years ago. Um, I was getting phone calls all the time. They're like, oh, Aiden's not Aiden's not listening to the teachers. He's doing this and that. And then Aiden also has issues with transitions. Um, so he was acting out, right? Um, he would want to kind of be on the computer. He was like trying to get on YouTube. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, you can't watch this at school. And then like the thing is like, they weren't really trying to get to know him. And he's very similar to Jackson mm-hmm. in the sense that if he knows that you're not um dealing with him in that way and he feels your energy is off he's gonna give you that same energy back he's not gonna be like oh my god hey he's gonna kind of be like whatever i don't want to hang out with you either you know what i'm saying so it's it's very um it's nice when you have a team of people that actually want to help you and help your child and that you feel that their intention is good because it just makes for the experience that much better for you. Yeah. So I love what you're doing with um, the, the fact that you're a therapist is very important. And then the fact that you have a small business that, you know, you're talking about self-care and motherhood. Mm-hmm. So can you um, just inform the audience a little bit about the work that you do regarding self-care and motherhood with your business? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, I'm a licensed therapist and I got into private practice, um, which gave me the flexibility to kind of be there with Jackson, you know, when I was married, um, while my husband was active duty at the time. And so we would kind of switch off because, you know, trying to find daycare for someone, you know, who has special needs, that was a whole nother thing. And Mm -hmm. so it offered me the flexibility when we moved to Georgia, um, right before the pandemic, um, I just continued my work via telehealth. And so I was seeing clients and it really, so the pandemic is a whole nother thing. It actually probably saved my business because in the transition, um, you know, I had a physical office in New Jersey and I was flying Mm -hmm. back and forth to see my clients like every couple weeks. Um, when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody was forced to stay at home. And so I was Mm -hmm. able to actually do like telehealth at that point. And the amount of clients who can't like, it was like somebody opened the floodgates. I, I remember specifically, like I probably had like two or three clients I was seeing 
back from New Jersey. So wasn't really making any money. One day I checked my um, email and I probably had like 50 emails in one day within like a few hours of requests for appointments. I'm like, what? Is someone like make an announcement or something? And everybody's like at home dealing with like all their issues, all their stuff and getting into therapy. And so I was working really, really hard. But what I noticed was um, I primarily work with women, um, professional women, um, many of whom are moms. But what I noticed across the board, whether it was woman, man, um, non-binary, black, white, um, everybody was just doing a lot especially women, like we take care of everybody. We don't focus on ourselves, um, which, you know, in the pandemic, you're kind of forced to deal with your own issues. And that's why people are in therapy. And so I was like, you know what? Like self-care is what really kind of saved me, like going through like a divorce, having a special needs child. Like I was in like this deep, deep depression. And it was really me focusing on one, like my mental health, my physical health and just taking care of myself so that I could, you know, be a good mommy to Jackson and Jordan. And so I had this idea. I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, help women kind of prioritize self-care. I think for women, we're always, you know, taking care of others. It's so important that we take care of ourselves. And so I started Well and Fit Living, which is a subscription box um, company, but we have more than just subscription boxes and it's a self-care box. So each month um, subscribers get at least five items to help them kind of focus on their self-care. And so it falls in the categories of like fitness, wellness, uh, mental health, um, things of that nature. And then I just started creating other products like my therapy cards and then like my journal because, you know, your physical health is so important. Like you have to, you know, keeping up with these kiddos. Jackson, I don't know where he gets his, his uh, energy from. Like he's like all sir. over the place. I was like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age. I cannot keep up. But it, it became like a passion for me to really kind of work on my body, you know, get my mind right. Um, just started putting me first. And I know it's so hard. You know, people think, okay, I'm being selfish, but it's more than just spas and pedicures. It's about setting healthy boundaries. It's about, you know, knowing what to say yes and no to. It's about paying attention to the people you hang around, what you're eating, what you're consuming. Um, are you being active? And so um, that has kind of been like my mission, um, especially going into like this new year. Um, and what I realized when this video went viral, like parents from all over started DMing me and they're burnt out and I get it. Like I was there mm -hmm. if it wasn't for, you know, one, my village to me taking a time out to take care of myself, I'd probably be laid out somewhere. So, um, I really want parents to know that, Hey, you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of care of your kiddo. So that's what I'm trying to do. I love that. No, seriously, it's, it's so important. And I feel like as a parent of a child with special needs, you're always on, right? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to kind of set those boundaries and, 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 and be like, you know, I need a minute right now. Cause a lot of the time you feel guilty mm -hmm. about well, I used to feel yeah. guilty about taking the minute. Not anymore. Because yeah. <laughs> I got to a point, like, you know, 8 and 13 now, you know, Jackson's six yeah, or five. Six. Uh -huh. Jackson is six. But let me tell you, when he was little, I, I I didn't really take time for myself. And man, I found myself being burned out and like, at you know, burning the candle from both ends. And, and that doesn't help anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't help Aiden. It doesn't help me. So I feel like... um part of part of the the mission of this is kind of you know informing moms that it is okay to take your time and and self-care is important you know 
we need to prioritize that because there's no way that we can pour from an empty cup. I've said this before on the on the show. And, um, you know, I feel like it's intrinsic to us being women, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, be, going into the vein of self-care, what does self-care look like for you? Uh, so <laughs> for me, um, first it started with me just setting boundaries. So I'm... And I realized this through years of therapy, uh, even though I'm a therapist, that I was a bit of a people pleaser. And so I would often say yes to things when I knew my schedule was already booked. I didn't want to do it, but I don't want to be a bad person or I don't want you know, people to think that I'm mean. And so learning to you know, really say no to the things that don't serve me, that I don't have time for, um, and saying yes to only the things that, you know, that are in alignment with what I wanna do and the things that matter to me. So that was like a huge thing, setting healthy boundaries with my family, friends, um, business uh, associates, everybody. Um, And I think the biggest step for me was, quitting a position that I had, which was a toxic work environment. Um, you know, I took a I took a job to kind of get myself back where I needed to be while I was still doing my private practice, but it was just so draining to go into that place um, and be around that negative toxic energy. So I worked really hard to be able to kind of walk away and I feel amazing. And so I get up most mornings, I work out. I don't always eat exactly what I'm supposed to eat, but I try to pay attention to the things that, you know, make me feel good, you know, that are good for me. Um, I definitely go and get my pedicures, my manicures. I like to travel, even though COVID is like, nope, none of that. But I just like having fun. I like doing stuff with my kids, having that time. And I like my alone time too. So um, Jackson, he knows like, okay, when mommy says I need to take a nap, like, he pretty much has free reign. Like, I'm not gonna like, (laughs) I'm not gonna fuss at him. Like I, give him a stack of paper, his sketch pens and all of these things that he can just draw. And, you know, my oldest son, he helps out a lot. Like when I'm really down and just exhausted, he'll come get his brother and take him in his room and they'll play video games. And so I really appreciate that. But yeah, it's just doing the things that I want to do and not feeling guilty about not doing certain things or not fitting a mold that someone feels like I should fit. I love that. Um, so I, I always ask this of all the moms. Um, so why is it important? Why do you feel it's important to have a balance between all the roles we play as women? You know, I think for so many years, women, especially women of color, like, you know, we have this cape that we wear um, and it's exhausting. <laughs> um I think Michelle Obama said it best when she said that, no, you can't have it all, at least not at the same time. Something is going to suffer. Like, you can't be like a perfect mom, a perfect wife, a perfect CEO, like all of these things. Like, you only have so much to give. And if you spread yourself too thin, it's like, what do you have to give? Like, if you're, if you as a parent are stretched too thin. You're not, you're no good for anyone. Like you're half doing it with your kid. You're half doing it with your job. And I know it's times where you may have to shift gears and, okay, I have this project. I really need to put my all into that. Um, So maybe my kids will eat (laughs) takeout for a week and it happens and you may feel a little guilty, but let that go. Like, I think the biggest thing that people kind of struggle with is forgiving ourselves, giving ourselves grace. So, you know, let go of all of that. Like, it doesn't really matter to what makes you happy. It's so important for like your life, your livelihood, like just your sanity. Um, Nobody Mm -hmm. wants to feel this constant pressure 
that you have to perform or you know keep up with all of these things it's not sustainable at least at least not in the long run and I know you know for many years like you know everyone told us okay you have to hustle team no sleep like all of these things like no get you some rest (laughs) rejuvenate go out there kill it do what you gotta do and Rinse and repeat, get some rest, take care of yourself, fill your cup, spend time with your kids, your loved ones, do all the things, but do it in a pace and a moderation that works for you. I feel like now, like people are um, awakening more and, and being more conscious of things, but there's also like people out there that have that toxic positivity and they, they're either like, you know, that hustle mindset, like go, go, go. Um, I don't rest and after, you know, I have a nine to five and then that five to nine and then I'm like doing this and that, whatever. And it, it's, you know, yes, there is time to do all the things, but also you need to, time to rest. Like, I feel like I'm a large advocate, <laughs> a huge advocate for, for naps, man. Oh, like yes. <laughs> naps are essential. People that say that they can nap, I don't really trust them, hey, you know, you <laughs> just <doing>? like, <laughs> I'm like, why are you not napping? Um, <laughs> So, Krista, I'm going to have a little personal question. So now that you're divorced, Mm -hmm. have you started dating yet? (sighs) So (laughs) I I did. I was dating. um, And that's another thing, like dating when you have, like, first of all. Oh, girl. (sighs) Let me tell I know, you, I know. This new <laughs> dating, like online, and I think the funniest meme I saw where they said, you know, the dating pool, I heard there's pee in the pool. There's not only pee, there's <laughs> poop. There's like old <laughs> prophylactic <drugs>. needles. <laughs> it's, it's disgusting out there. Um, oh my but. God. You know, I I was divorced like a year before I really um, seriously kind of went into like trying to date. Mm-hmm. And I met someone online and, you know, it was hard having that conversation. One, that I have two kids, single mom. <laughs> um, and then two, that, hey, my son has autism, but it was... To the point where I felt, okay, you know, this is someone I feel like we're going to be exclusive. Um, I'm ready to introduce him to my kids. Yes, we had that conversation. And mm-hmm. yeah, it it went well. Um, I'm no longer dating though, but, you know, it wasn't a bad experience. It's just, it just wasn't what I want. Like, I have no interest in getting married anytime soon. Um, I'm just focusing on me and my children and my business. So, you know, mm-hmm. we were just kind of like in two different um, spaces. So I'm good with not dating at the moment. I'm good. I, I'm not ready to go back out there. Sharks and uh, everything out there. I'm not ready. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it is tough, man. Like, I, I feel like we're not the same age, but we're like close enough in age that it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's too, it, it, the, the dating pool now, like you said, there's a lot of not so good things out there, but also like, you know, as single mothers and then moms of children with special needs, it's like, we need to be hyper vigilant about who we allow in our lives and the type of people that we, you know, let around our kids. And, um, you know, I talk a lot about like dating too, because I am a single mom and I've been divorced like 12 years already. Wow. But yeah, like it, it took me a while to start dating again because mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like when my son first got diagnosed and stuff. Um, but then when I started dating and it was just like, you know, kind of like getting, setting myself up to date with a purpose, mm-hmm. you know? Um, And to make sure that I know what I want so that, you know, I'm attracting the right type of people into my life, not just people that are there to, you know, do whatever, whatever it is that people are (laughs) are doing nowadays. But um, yeah, so 
okay, so you told us a little bit about Jackson already. Um, we know he loves to do art. He's a uh, he's very um outgoing. So tell us a little bit more about him and like who he, who he is and what makes him sparkle. <sighs> I. <laughs> I always jokingly say Jackson is my no limit soldier. If he was my first child, he would be an only child because he keeps me <laughs> on my toes. Like he is, Jackson is funny. He's hilarious. Like he, he's outgoing, but he tries to act like he's kind of shy. So he does like this quiet whisper thing now mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. he whispers everything to me to tell who, whomever is talking to him. But he's just a very fun loving kid, like high energy. He loves art. He loves Sonic, Mario, um, YouTube, like he'll sit and record himself on the phone like he has a YouTube channel. So I've been considering <laughs> um, allowing him to do have a channel. You know, he I, he's just I don't know. He it's just something about him. Like some of the things he says, I'm like, are you really six? So he talks to me like <laughs> Like, he's a, like wise beyond their right. years. Like now he, he does this. I don't know where he hears this. He probably got it from me. So he'll talk to me. He's like, does that make sense? And I'm like, well, why do you keep saying that to me? Like, do you think I'm dumb? Or does that make sense? <laughs> and then I if I tell him something, like if he wants something and I'm like, no, Jackson. He's like, but that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't I like, why doesn't it make any sense to you? Because I told you no. So he will go back and forth with me, like about anything. Like he's he's just so I funny. He, I he said the craziest stuff comes out of his mouth, and I always said oh like gosh. I should have video cameras like in my home, in my car at all times because you never know what is coming out of Jackson's oh my mouth. God. Yeah. And for him to kind of go viral, it's just it just tickles me because I'm like, see, I knew it. Like as long as I've been trying to become like an influencer on <laughs> social media, <laughs> I post my son and it goes crazy. Like Jesus, it, I, I I I'm I'm dying to have um your barber on on the show uh i actually interviewed another barber he's from ohio and um he he he's very much he's like he has noble barbershop and he does these events like once a month that he has kids with special needs um come into the shop on his day off he comes in and he gives them haircuts and he's very similar to your barber in the sense that he does like whatever it is that the kid needs to be able to give them that cut um, and the program that he has, he's like, he has people sponsor the, the haircuts for the parents, which is nice too. But I definitely want her, want to bring her on because, you know, that's part of our village, you know, as parents of children with special needs like people that understand our kids mm -hmm. and get it and are patient with them. That's like something that is like, it can't be measured. It's not like there's nothing tangible that we could measure it with, but it means so much, you know, and it brings so much value to our lives, you know? Yeah. But, um, uh -huh. go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, absolutely. And with Re, she really has become a part of our family. And we're actually trying to do something. We're trying to put something together for Autism Awareness Month, like an event okay. or something. Um just like the I with this kind of blowing up, like the idea just kind mm -hmm. of came to us. So we're like trying to find a space and be able to have parents come in and probably like some other barbers to get like some tips and you know be able to do stuff for like the kids. That's cool. Yeah. I would love to come. Let me know because in April I'm off anyway mm -hmm. <laughs> since I teach. But yeah, definitely let's um connect with that and then I'll give you the information mm -hmm. for um. For Vernon uh, from Ohio so maybe we could all come down and that would be like a pretty dope event oh, I feel yeah. 
And with that, we're going to end the episode uh, how I usually end it, which is follow me at Comadreando Pod on IG and Dr. LaQuista on IG at LaQuista Arena. <laughs> and if you have any questions whatsoever, if you want Dr. LaQuista back or Re, the barber, <laughs> the famous barber on, <laughs> let me know. Send me a comadregram via email at comadreando at escthenetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. Uh, thank you for spending the afternoon with your comadres and have a happy, happy Sunday. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.